Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really glad to have you with us for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Once again, it's quite an accomplishment that we actually made it to the end of the week. Jim Garrity is away. Here in his place is John Gabriel, the undisputed king of stuff. He's also a columnist for Discourse Magazine with the Mercatus Center and also a columnist with the Arizona Republic. John, it's always great to have you with us. Oh, always great to be here, Greg. Well, it's a uh, significant anniversary today. I haven't seen a ton of attention on it in the mainstream media, which is kind of surprising. If they do bring it up, uh, I'm sure they will try to connect it to Donald Trump in some way. But it was 50 years ago today that Richard Nixon became the only president thus far to resign from office due to the Watergate scandal, uh, assuming Joe Biden can get the media to not pay attention to his uh, current cognitive state. Nixon will probably remain the only uh, president to have resigned, at least for the foreseeable future. So the thing that I always think of on this day is a couple of things, uh, John. First of all, it's that every Republican scandal after that, John Dean branded worse than Watergate, uh, (laughs) always with the glasses at the tip of the nose. So there's no snootiness happening at all there. Uh, And then also, um, some folks know this, some may not, uh, G. Gordon Liddy, key Watergate figure, television star, but uh, radio talk show host primarily in the later part of his life, was a colleague of mine here at Radio America. And just before he retired in in 2012, uh, he sat down uh, for an interview with me and we talked about a lot of different things. Uh, But he also talked about Watergate in detail, including how it got started. He was working uh, with the Committee to Re-Elect the President, which was given the acronym CREEP, which was probably not the best way to uh, go forward. But this is 1972, uh, and there he was in his office minding his own business when this happened. I was called by um, Eagle Crow, who was an assistant to John Ehrlichman. And he said, John Dean wants to pitch you on something. And he said, uh, I think I, meaning Crow, ought to be there. That's because nobody trusted John Dean. So I went up to Dean's office. He said that uh, he wanted an intelligence operation to operate against the Democratic Party. And so they came up with a bunch of uh, elaborate schemes that got shot down because they were too expensive. And eventually uh, the break in at the Watergate complex was uh, the one that got green lighted. And it was to allegedly find information about a call girl ring or more than one maybe even run out of the dnc so uh whenever you see john dean playing holier than thou on msnbc that's that's the backstory at least as uh, g gordon liddy remembers it so uh john uh, thoughts on thoughts on the golden anniversary of uh nixon's resignation yeah uh showing my age here we moved to arizona when i was six and in the summers in phoenix it's kind of like winters in cleveland you just stay inside And we had just moved to this brand new neighborhood. And I just remember all day long Watergate hearings on TV. I couldn't watch cartoons. I couldn't watch Gilligan's Island reruns. It was all Watergate. I know later in high school, G. Gordon Liddy, I read his book, Will. That was probably the first political book I ever read. I don't know what age I was then. Fairly early in high school. But my dad, hardcore conservative. My mom, hardcore liberal. And so I would tell my mom I enjoyed... G. Gordon Liddy's book so much, I said, she has to call me J. Conrad Gabriel. <sighs> yeah, that, that set her up the wall a little bit. I knew just exactly how to phrase things to drive my poor mom, rest in peace, mom, drive her a little up the wall. So uh, it's weird to read about it now. And just with all the craziness going on these days, I'm like, wow, they made a really big deal out of that. And now it would be, I don't know, depending on the party the president's in, it might be a one day news cycle. It could be. It could be. My other favorite story about that from uh, Liddy is that while he was a host with us, so he was, gosh, he must have been in his 70s. He was on Celebrity Fear Factor, along with the likes of uh, Todd Bridges from Different Strokes and uh, uh, Tempest Bledsoe from The Cosby Show. And in the beginning, Joe Rogan, who was the host of that show, is uh, doing a quick interview of all these celebrities. And he he says, so you were convicted more than anybody else of all these offenses related to Watergate. Were you actually guilty? And Liddy says, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and he did really well on the show, for, despite being much older than all those people. But anyway, that's 
that's that's the connection to Watergate uh, 50 years ago today. But um, like you said, that seems like a piker compared to some of the stuff we're dealing in this country and in what's happening in other countries. We don't actually have a good martini today, but man, this has to be talked about because what's Labour been in power in the UK for what a month, a little over a well, month I- now, and holy smokes, uh, <laughs> they are. Uh, basically destroying freedom on a daily basis there. This is a clip from a fellow named Stephen Parkinson. He's the director of public prosecutions of England and Wales. And this is his warning to people about their online statements. The offense of incitement to racial hatred involves uh, publishing or distributing material uh, which is uh, insulting uh, or abusive, which is intended to or likely to start racial hatred. So if you retweet that, then you're republishing that, and then potentially you're committing that offense. And we do have dedicated police officers who are scouring social media. Their job is to look for this material uh, and then follow up with uh, identification arrests and so forth. So it's a really, really serious. People might think they're not doing anything uh, harmful. They are, and the consequences will be visited upon them. Listen to part of that again. And we do have dedicated police officers who are scouring social media. Their job is to look for this material uh, and then follow up with uh, identification arrests and so forth. Well, that's not chilling at all. Meanwhile, the Crown Prosecution Service puts out this social media statement. You can be prosecuted for posting material online which incites violence or hatred. You can also be prosecuted for sharing this material. Your online actions can have consequences. Think before you post. Now, John, I think you and I would probably agree that if you're saying, let's go kill the fill in the blank, that's prosecutable speech right there. Or I don't like this guy, so let's go take him out. Uh, That's prosecutable speech. It's so easy to see how this could be badly and egregiously abused. And the example that always comes to mind is when the left just randomly decided that Sarah Palin was to blame for Gabby Giffords being shot by a total insane person uh, in Arizona, all because months earlier, before the midterm elections, uh, Sarah Palin had had an online map targeting the district she thought Republicans had a chance of flipping from the Democrats, and Giffords was one of them. The, the ability of the government, depending on its uh, incentives to exploit this, would be immense. Yeah, it really is amazing how far the UK has fallen. Um, rest in peace, uh, George Orwell. He must be uh, spinning in his grave at about 360 RPMs right now, uh, looking at everything going on. This really is straight out of 1984 at this point, and how they can put up with that. The citizens there is just absolutely beyond me. Uh, Thank God we have the First Amendment. Uh, May it be enforced um, as intended, just allowing people to speak their mind. Because when you shut down speech, you don't correct bad think or wrong think, in Orwell's phrase. Um, All you do is you push that stuff underground, and it gets more and more and more (laughs) intense until it finally explodes. I I think looking at all the violence going on in the UK these days, maybe have uh, tons of police focus on that rather than um, scrolling uh, Twitter and TikTok. Yeah, that would make a lot more sense because there's a big uptick in crime. Uh, We know what the Labor Party's uh, doing here with this policy, and it is absolutely chilling. And when you think about it, yes, we rebelled from England, but we incorporated a lot of their legal system into our code. But like you said, thankfully, we also have the Bill of Rights. Uh, so it's much, much harder for the government to do this. Where in England, which has been around now for almost a thousand years since the Norman Conquest, this is just uh, watching rights erode in real time. Right. And the government celebrating that they're eroding. It's just really appalling to see and a good object lesson. You know, uh, the freest countries can. Uh, fall away very, very quickly unless you're constantly just uh, propping up the rights of the individual. And I'm glad America, for the time at least, is uh, doing just that. Europe is this great canary in the coal mine. They keep doing stupid stuff and it keeps being terrible and it keeps (laughs) yielding terrible consequences. But way too many people in this country don't admit that. And so we just keep barreling down this path with climate policy. And it's just amazing. So Europe, uh, uh, at this point in history, Europe just is there to serve as an object lesson to Americans, I think. 
Yeah, it's not Here's good. what not to do. If you're worried about your uh, free speech rights in England, you should be. But uh, don't drink too much at the local pub without taking Z-Biotics first. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut, and it's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night. You do still need to drink responsibly, but you'll definitely feel better in the morning. And I have a colleague here who um, always knew what his limit was, and he could feel fine the next morning. As he got older, not so much. Tried the Zbiotics, he was right back where he'd been before. So it works. Go to zbiotics.com slash 3ML to get 15% off your first order when you use 3ML at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantees. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Visit zbiotics.com slash 3ML and use the code 3ML at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and our good times. All right, John, on to our bad martini now. And yesterday, Inez and I talked about the um, back and forth between Tim Walls, Trash, and J.D. Vance uh, at the opening rally for the Harris-Walls ticket on Tuesday. So then Vance firing back saying, you left your unit, you retired uh, when you found out they were going to Iraq. That part's somewhat disputed. But as we chronicled yesterday, Walls definitely said he wanted to get rid of weapons of war that he carried in war, which is definitely... Not true. The Harris-Walls campaign says that that was just loose language, and so they've cleaned that up on their website. Uh, But over on CNN, Brianna Keeler uh, decided that the real problem here isn't that Tim Walls has uh, at least embellished, if not outright uh, fabricated, some of his military service. The problem here is J.D. Vance. Even though J.D. Vance has not lied at all about his military service, just the title that he had, which is the official military title, is somehow questions his position to make the allegations against Tim Walls. Here's what she said. I also think that J.D. Vance, as a messenger on this, may be an imperfect messenger because we have, as you introduced him, as a combat correspondent, which was what his title was. But when you dig a little deeper into that, he was a public affairs specialist, someone who did not see combat, which certainly the title combat correspondent kind of gives you a different impression. So he may be the imperfect messenger on that. So, John, you are a veteran. Uh, You're a veteran of the United States Navy. So you understand uh, military culture a lot better than I do. What do you make of uh, Keeler suggesting that just based on Vance's official title and because he wasn't uh, officially in combat, which he fully admits, that somehow he's not qualified to speak on what Tim Walls did or didn't do? Yeah, well... I was in the Navy and served on a submarine as a reactor operator. Now me saying that, that's fine. It was nothing glamorous. I basically uh, twiddled knobs and uh, watched meters and recorded what was going on. Not exactly Rambo there. But if I came on here saying, actually, I was a Navy SEAL. Uh, remember that uh, Remember that time we uh, the Iraqi government totally collapsed and we went in? Yeah, that was mostly me. That would be bad. So, Brianna, take notes here. If you lie about what you do, it's very bad. And military members, veterans, uh, current service members are extremely sensitive to this because it's a matter, literally, it's a matter of life and death. And every single veteran I know is outraged about it. They won't vote for him. They're disgusted by him, even those who are not big fans of Trump. You know, I have a lot of independent friends, and they're kind of like the heck with both these uh, parties. But you do not do this. Um, There are many very colorful phrases for people who do this, uh, pretend they did a lot more. And uh, this is kind of proving, too, because the people I've known who have really been in it, unlike me, um, they're the ones who never talk about their service. And it seems like uh, Governor Walls loves talking up all the amazing things that he did when he was, I don't know, carrying an unloaded weapon around Italy. I don't remember any. Re- I don't think he was landing at Anzio. I I think he was just uh, enjoying Italy. I personally would like a free trip to Italy. So if the U.S. military, any branch will do, will send me out there, that would be great. Just a month or two, that'll be good. Yes, and he he did deploy to Italy as part of his guard duty. And here's the thing: I uh, stumbled across on Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt. But Brianna Keeler is married 
to, at least the time she was engaged to him, an active duty Green Beret. Wow. So she, she knows. Know she should easily know better than to say anything remotely close to that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. It really is a military culture thing. Wall Street Journal came out with an article this morning, an op-ed from the editorial board saying, well, you know, I don't know if it was that bad what Walls did, um, but I don't remember a lot of them in uh, having, a, a, having a storied uh, career in the military. I'm like, yeah, maybe it is. You just kind of have to be in the military, but it becomes a very gut level reaction of how dare he and outrage and disgust. Um, especially among people who are, if not even in the military, they have family members, they come from, you know, they're a military brat or something like that. Um, it's just a different culture there, and you do not uh, abandon your unit um, right before they are shipped out, deployed to a combat zone. And there are other veterans pointing out the combat correspondents that were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan right. because it's not a job that has no danger. And secondly, for the media to make that call, is also reprehensible because it's often these combat correspondents that take care of the war correspondents that exactly. are in a war zone. And so to to trash him like that by, you know, oh, well, they weren't really in combat, even though it's part of their title. Um, shameful. Yeah, definitely. Should you be freaking out over the massive stock market crash over the past weekend? The Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski. Every day, Chris helps unpack the connection between politics and the economy and how it affects your wallet. High quality companies already knew we were in a recession. It's just starting to show up. They've made the necessary adjustments already to make sure they come out on top. But are you invested in those high quality companies? Whether it's happening in D.C. or down on Wall Street, it's affecting you financially. Be informed. Check out the Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, well, we've had some pretty heavy martinis here, so let's close on the lighter side, but it's also somewhat infuriating. Uh, Politico has had a banner week. Man, they just, they've just they just stepped in it all over the place. The latest one last night, and John, I saw you flag this on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days, about uh, this column from Derek Guy, who is a menswear writer who has written for the Washington Post. And of course, it's all about how, quote in the headline, Tim Wall's camo cap is more important than you think. Democratic VP candidate Tim Walls is making casual wear a political boon. And so they're saying, well, he was picked in part to uh, help shore up the blue wall in the Electoral College. As a result, he has injected an unexpected issue into our political discourse. That's right, casual wear. Walls has a fashionable or perhaps helpfully unfashionable advantage with his flannel-lined L.L. Bean barn boots, scuffed work boots, and woodsy camo caps. Walls is one of the few male politicians who looks normal in the kind of unpretentious clothing that many voters prefer to wear themselves. Some corners of the internet are already responding to Walls' car talk chic. Quote, he might run for vice president or he might clean the garage. It's the weekend. Anything can happen. Read one viral tweet. Quote, breaking. Potential running mate Tim Walls spotted outside VP Kamala Harris's residence tweaking the lawnmower's carburetor because he didn't like that darn knocking sound it was making. Joked a columnist from USA Today. Another ex-user called him an REI hire. And so then it says, Walls's remarkably unremarkable look displays a rare talent that few of his contemporaries share. Despite America's long trend of dressing down, male politicians looking to earn every man cred via casual clothing often fumble. And then they just take a completely unnecessary swipe at Ron DeSantis because of those boots he wore after the hurricane a couple of years ago. And uh, they say, really, since Reagan, everyone struggled. But now... This guy who's fresh out of L.L. Bean is a refreshing change, John. It's just ridiculous. Every every election year, we see this happen. There's fashion uh, reports, these in-depth fashion reports. The Republicans are always evil. You know, oh, my gosh, this candidate is wearing a tie. You know who else wore ties? Um, this indicates fascism. And then the Democrat can wear a potato sack, and they are lauded as... Uh, Oh, they're genre bending. Oh, I've never seen this kind of uh, moxie from uh, these Democrats. It's just ridiculous. And why they do this, they do this every time. And it's so tiring. I remember back during 2016, um, Melania wore a white dress to the convention, if memory serves. 
Yes. And they said, this is white supremacy, straight up. She's wearing something white. She obviously is a fascist. And then a few weeks later, Hillary wears an all-white pantsuit. This is such a great thing. White is the color of innocence and purity. And I'm just like, oh my God, why do you do this? Nobody is convinced by this. So um, come on, Politico, get it together. At least I just miss the days when the press pretended on occasion to be objective. Now it's just like, just full out. Look, we just don't like Republicans. We're going to criticize them for everything they do. Yes, absolutely right. But it, like I said, it's been a banner week for Politico because in addition to this just embarrassing fiasco, they actually had a story uh, towards the beginning of the week entitled Mussolini, Trump, and what assassination attempts really do. A scholar of Mussolini and authoritarianism explains how failed attacks can be used to consolidate power. So they talk about how Mussolini survived an assassination attempt in the mid-20s and then had a bandage on his nose and he used it to uh, you know, become an even stronger strongman. And they say the comparison between Mussolini and Trump can be overstated. And for one thing, Trump is not in power at the moment. He's an aspiring strongman. But we can't know for sure how he would have reacted had the shooting occurred when he was in the White House and whether he would have used it to crack down on critics or expand his authority. What is clear already is that the assassination attempt has made Trump's personality cult more robust and more powerful for his followers. His claims of being a victim targeted on their behalf are now more credible, and his persona cemented as an indomitable fighter, and he knows it. And then they got a picture of Mussolini with his nose bandage right next to Trump at the convention with his ear bandage. And so <laughs> they're saying, oh, if he's elected, he's going to use this to aggressively deport people and uh, do other things. And yeah, so, that lucky guy almost getting assassinated. <laughs> man, he really lucked out with that. <laughs> what is wrong with these people? I don't know. I, I don't know. This is just brain rot. This is when, I don't know, you're uh, just mainlining social media 24-7 and don't uh, occasionally take a breath, relax, and have a nice weekend. Lighten up exactly. a bit there, Politico. Exactly. They need to get their story straight on the left. Are we going to just uh, memory hole this like a lot of people seem to be doing that <laughs> didn't even happen less than a month ago? Right. Uh, or if other you're people Google, that, just memory hole it. Yeah, exactly. Then uh, you've got the, the Mussolini comparisons going on. I guess when you have to get something to the editor, yeah, you come up with that. But <laughs> John, it is quite, quite the way to end the week. But uh, I appreciate you being here as always. Always a lot of fun. Oh, great to be on. Thanks so much for having me. John Gabriel, he is the undisputed king of stuff. He is a columnist for Discourse Magazine with the Mercatus Center, and he's also a columnist for the Arizona Republic. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends to do it as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They really do help us a lot. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us all on X. John is at xjohn, E-X-J-O-N. Jim is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Jim Garrity will be back on Monday. Have a great weekend and join us on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.